Center. Um, it's just to honor our active members and celebrate the end of the year school before finals. We will um, have more information on our Instagram and website soon. Next slide, please. And then um, don't forget about our active opportunities spreadsheets. We added in a lot, a bunch of um, new opportunities, volunteering, internships, programs, um, you guys check it out for extracurriculars if you want to um, just get to like participate in some events um, and then if an officer can please paste the form link in the chat. And the next slide please. Oh and uh, today's a deadline for the officer applications for the 2023-2024 year and um, all the positions are available and um, you should join because we host cool events <laughs> surround yourself with highly motivated people like uh, Nessa and then and Manny of course and Victor and Megan and everyone else and then uh, you can also gain valuable experience like just today All right, next slide, please. Uh, so these are our social media accounts. You can get connected with, with us through these accounts. We also post regularly on our YouTube channel. So after every guest speaker event, we usually post a event on YouTube just for anyone who's not able to make it. So you can watch on our YouTube as well. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. And then we have our content agenda today. We have introduction and background. We have university years and tips, Nina's presentation and resources. And then lastly, encouraging words for us students. Next slide, please. Um, so today, just to give a small little brief introduction to our guest. We have certified registered nurse, assistant, nurse anesthesiologist Nina Nguyen. Um, Nina, if you can please uh, give a more brief introduction to yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Oregon, but I moved down to California to pursue school. I worked as like um, a certified nursing assistant as an ICU nurse, and then now I'm doing a certified registered nurse anesthetist, which is a super tongue twister. Um, otherwise, I, uh, in between working, I like to just um, hang out with my friends. I do a lot of puzzling and um, hiking, outdoor stuff, and I love doing events like this. So it's it's really nice to be able to be here and kind of share a little bit about the job that I love to do. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so like I had mentioned, I'm from Oregon. I say Portland, but it's actually Happy Valley area. I call it the Valley of Happy People. And I had mentioned that I'm into jigsaw puzzling, but I actually am really into it. I'm currently working on a 60,000 piece puzzle, which is the largest puzzle you can own and buy right now from Costco, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I like watching movies. I do a lot of Bible studies, um, just kind of I'm normal. <laughs> I do other things too besides puzzle. Um, so I did graduate CRNA school in 2020, actually right before COVID started. So, and everything shut down. So that was kind of an interesting transition. And uh, I have um, a work-related Instagram that I'm currently taking a break on, but I'll probably start posting again, maybe in a month or so. And that's uh, N square 32. And then I also have a puzzle Instagram uh, at extremely puzzled if you're interested in looking at that. All right, let's move on to the undergrad journey. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I mentioned I was a certified nursing assistant. I did that for under a year. And then I actually, um, I'll kind of backtrack. I was in college at Oregon State University. And actually at the time I wanted to do um, pharmacy, 
but I wanted more um, interaction with the patients than just telling them about the drugs. So um, I thought about pre-med. And so I did the pre-med route during that first year. And I was talking to my like pre-med advisor um, and he was actually saying my personality seems to fit more of a nurse. So then I switched to nursing in um, Oregon State University, but they didn't have a nursing degree at the time. So I actually applied to Walla Walla University and I got in. So I had kind of a transition of like not knowing what I was going to do, but um, praise God, I was able to go into nursing. So I did go to Walla Walla University. They actually had a Portland campus in Oregon. So I didn't have to go to Washington except to graduate. And I graduated in 2014. Did a lot of hospital volunteering um, and just trying to like uh, community service, et cetera. And then, so once I graduated with a bachelor's of science in nursing from Walla Walla, I actually got into a residency program um, where I was able to get right into the ICU as a new grad, which can be difficult to do. Um, but I was able to work um, at a place called Mount Hood Medical Center for three years. It was a med surge ICU. And then during that time period, I attend, um, applied for CRNA school and I happened to get into uh, Loma Linda um, for the master's degree. Oh, that sounds so exciting. <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide. So these are just some pictures I grabbed from my my laptop. Um, my schooling, I was with 16. Um, there were 16 of us. So we got pretty close because um, just they were actually all around the country. Some people from California, some people from like New York, um, Hawaii, you know, it's just kind of cool to see a bunch of different people come together and they're all ICU nurses, very smart, very motivated. Um, the top left is just, uh, that was our um, anatomy uh, teacher, Dr. Nava. We all got tie dye hats that were matching. And then, uh, you know, I did some clinical pictures and on the far right, that was actually our graduation dinner that happened before COVID. And it was just, uh, we were kind of all praying because it's a faith-based uh, university that I went to. And then this is just us looking real good at that graduation dinner. And then uh, the bottom left is just my graduation picture from CRNA school. You look so like happy and cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are the highlights. <laughs> Love yeah. that. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so like... Um, kind of mentioned this already, but I went to Walla Walla for nursing school, and then I graduated nursing school in 2014, and then I went to Loma Linda for CRNA school, graduated just, I mean, I just hit my three-year anniversary, actually, which is kind of crazy to think about, and I am currently working as a CRNA in a, um, a hospital in California. I also work at a surgery center as well, so I work in uh, two places. All right, let's move on to the next slide. And now for nursing and CRNA school. Okay, so actual schooling. Um, most of the CRNA schools now uh, require a doctorate, um, but I was actually able to get into the, the last master's um, program that was at um, Loma Linda. So my my group of friends, my classmates and I, we call ourselves the last master's because we were literally the last class to get a master's degree. And we kind of got um, grandfathered in because now you need a doctorate. And I just tell people I'd rather be called Master Nina than Dr. Nina. So you can go call me Master Nina later. But it consisted of three years. Um, so the first year, it's just very heavy on classroom stuff. You're just studying, um, reading the books, doing all these tests. And the first nine months, or that's what I mentioned with the full-time didactics. Uh, as the second year kind of starts approaching, we do the white coat ceremony right before we hit clinicals. So we usually do like a couple days in the classroom, usually like the first two days or something. And then we'll do a couple of days gradually into the clinical setting at specific um, hospital sites. And that can be usually like um, eight, 10, 12 hours, just depending on where you're at. Um, and then la uh, your senior year, your last year, it pretty much transitions to when you only are in clinicals. So that's full-time uh, schedule. And again, each clinical site varies on 
um, kind of hours and stuff, but it's a full-time schedule. And on top of that, you study on your own. You have like sometimes uh, weekly quizzes or tests that you have to study um, on your own. So it's a lot more independent towards the last year as you become a senior, but um, it's a lot more clinical basis, which a lot more people like, because, you know, you you can study the books all you want but until you apply your skills in a clinical setting. That, I think, is when the true learning happens. You actually like can see something come to life, like something you just learned about and you see the actual effect. And you're just like, wow, like this is how anesthesia is, you know. So that's kind of my favorite part. But that's essentially the gist of the, the three years of the CRNA school. Now with the doctor program, I think it's an additional uh, nine months. So it might be maybe three and a half years uh, to three years and nine months or something. Yeah, Um. so when I was back in freshman in high school, I always wanted to be a CRNA. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I always thought it was like four years because um. I don't know why I was like, oh my God, it's four years. It's so long. But now I guess if I do end up doing it, it's probably going to be four years. It'll be about four years. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the next slide. So university versus CRNA school. In terms of, I guess I can compare nursing school with CRNA school. Um, I thought nursing school was hard, but <laughs> CRNA school is actually way harder um, when you think about it, these are people who have been ICU nurses, so they've been critically thinking. Um, they're very motivated because you don't like you don't go back to school, right? right? Nursing school, you graduate, you work as a nurse. To have to go back to school again to pursue another three to four years of schooling, it takes a lot of like sacrifice and commitment, and you have to really want it to to do it. So um, I actually. I respect all my classmates and it was kind of amazing to be able to learn with them. Um, the tests were harder. Um, I would say that, you know, I think passing is normally um, like a C, right? But for us, it was like, a, you had to have, was it either 80 or 85% um, for your scores to pass. So if you were at the lower end, you know, 80% you think would be great, but is actually on the lower end because everyone else is getting A's. So you just had to kind of like, it was nice to have motivation from your fellow classmates because everyone's so motivated. You're like, I gotta get up there too. I am not by far the smartest in my class. I was just average, I think. And that's just, um, was a really humbling experience. So I definitely think CRNA school is harder. It was a bit of a learning curve. And I think the first, um, the first term when we started didactics, we were all in the same boat. We're like, how do we study again? We haven't studied in like, two years, three years, some people a decade. So we're having to develop all these study habits again, right? Um, a lot of groups study was really helpful because like, I might be really good at coming up with memorization stuff. You might really be really good at explaining application. And then somebody else might be good at like, you know, something else. So I think being able to work together in a group environment was super helpful, as well as obviously taking time to like do a lot of flashcards, note cards, you know, or um, people write, people highlight, everyone had a different technique. But I think the you cannot cram for a CRNA school test. So there's a lot of like making sure you study kind of every day and uh, apply it. And uh, yeah, so you can't you can't do that, unfortunately, in school. Um, content difference. Yeah, I think uh, with CRNA school, there were some things that were similar to nursing school in terms of like, there was an assessment class, there was anatomy and physiology again. But as you get into the anesthesia related courses, it was very geared towards like, like anatomy, we had to make sure we knew what the airway looked like, you know, um, in terms of anesthesia techniques and complications and pharmacology, it was more specific, specifically geared towards medications that we would normally use. Versus like as a nurse, there might be different medications, you know? Um, and if you guys have questions about uh, some of the common meds I use, we can go over that later. But it was just very like specific and very focused, which I thought was good because, you know, you don't want just the broad thing. If you're doing anesthesia, you need to know stuff that's applicable to specifically your field. So that's what I liked about the content for CRNA school. Um, and then... For the content for nursing school versus CRNA school, you did mention that um, CRNA school was much more difficult. Um, 
can you like elaborate sort of in like what way is it is it that it's like more detailed or is there more content to learn or I think it's more detailed and plus the um, expectations and the standards are kind of higher like I mentioned the grade um you know kind of the 80 percent or higher um but in terms of like like I think for um, anatomy and physiology we went down to like like this cellular level for some of these things and I was just like you don't really need to know that per se for clinical aspect but they just wanted you to if you needed to explain things you need to you you know they went deeper into that um I think with nursing too when you think about nursing school they do um there are so many different fields in nursing there's pediatrics right um there's um geriatrics there's OB nursing there's um you know, a uh, specific kind of ner like um, ICU nursing, cardiac stuff. And so, so I feel like it was a little bit of everything, psych nursing. And and when it comes to CRNA school, it's like I said, very focused and specific. And because of that, they're able to go deeper. So the content is a little bit more detailed versus nursing school. They're trying to give you like a little bit of everything so that you can figure out what kind of nursing you'd want to go into. So I think that was kind of what I noticed um yeah so it's just like deeper content I guess yeah that seems to be like a common trend among um most of the guest speakers that we've had here um when they talk about like um content difference from you know their undergraduate years to graduate years it seems that within the grad it's mm -hmm. more difficult and it seems to be more focused too all right, mm -hmm. let's move on to the next slide. So I'm assuming this schedule was based on like me working as a CRNA. So because I kind of mentioned it briefly in the school setting, but um, schedule wise, it kind of depends on where you work. So I have some friends, some CRNAs who actually work at a hospital that they work uh, four 10 hour shifts. They don't do weekends, they don't do holidays, they don't do call. So sounds like a good schedule, right? Some people, they do five, eight hour shifts for the weekend. Again, they don't do weekends, call and all this stuff. Um, I work at places where there is call. So I'll do 24 hour shifts occasionally. I just got off a 24 hour shift this morning. Um, sometimes you do a 10 hour shift, a 12 hour shift, a 14 hour shift. It just kind of varies depending on where you work. Um, and I used to work at a trauma hospital for my first job. And because it was trauma, you just have to have people on call all the time, right? So we all took turns being on call for like IR, different emergencies. And I think there I did three 12 hour shifts, which is actually a nurse's schedule. Uh, most nurses who work in the hospital work three 12s, which I think it's great. You have more days off and you can recover. But um, as a CRNA, if you do three twelves, that's great. But most of the time I work, at least at my current job, 44 to 48 hours a week. Um, again, if you work at other places uh, that you could just do 40 hours a week with the four 10 hour shifts. Um, but I think for me, it kind of depends on what skill sets you still want to keep for the people who work at those, um, at least the hospital that I know of that does the four tens, they don't do OB. So they don't do epidurals and spinals for C-sections as much. Um, they have other residents do peripheral nerve blocks, which is just a way to like numb the arm for certain surgeries. Um, I like to be able to do those skills. So I purposely pick hospitals where I'm able to have autonomy and able to practice to my full potential with everything I learned during school. Um, so, but if you like a nice schedule, then I then go for it, I know. That's awesome. So there's certain things you look for when you look for a job, right? You look for a good schedule, look for, um, do you want the experience? Do you want the location? Do you want the pay? Do you want, you know, um, kind of those things. And you can't always get all your things that you want. There's no like perfect job. So you kind of have to pick and choose, like you compromise. And so for me, I compromise kind of on my hours, but I get really good experience. I love the environment. I love the people I work with. They're fantastic. And I feel like I get to do a little bit of everything that I was taught. So that's kind of, I kind of like uh, rabbit trail a little bit on the schedule thing, but uh, that's the gist of that. 
And then for a didactus, um, I went back to the school part. Some of the things we learned, like I mentioned, was anatomy, physiology, anesthesia techniques, implications, um, kind of like if a patient has sleep apnea, what does that mean for anesthesia? If a patient has high blood pressure, what does that mean for anesthesia? You know, things like that. Uh, pharmacology, especially the meds that we typically use in our um, practice. Then obviously the problems that can happen with anesthesia, because anesthesia is a benign. There's everything I do and give in terms of anesthesia wise can have a side effect and a consequence if not done properly. And so we have to be able to problem solve when those emergencies happen. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Um, all right, so now we are on to words of encouragement from our guest speaker. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, if I could do it again. Oh yeah, I, I seriously love what I do. Um, There are some good days, there are some really bad days, but in general, like, being able to to like say so my my best days are when like the patient wakes up they're not feeling pain and they're just like I, the surgery's done already and I'm like yeah it's like magic we're all done you went to sleep you woke up and now the surgery's done your back is fixed your hip is fixed you know all this stuff um that's really rewarding to me or or when they're just super stressed out before they go into surgery and I'm able to like offer words of encouragement to them and like you know um give them some support because it's a very stressful time right surgery is not a common thing to have every day and so it's just really rewarding to me to be able to to be there for the patients and to be able to provide good anesthesia so um, while I wouldn't repeat school again because that was a really hard time in my life I literally don't have any regrets um, I did my best. I work at a good place now. And I think the best thing that you can do is, I think, like I mentioned, to treasure the time that you're able to spend with, especially with your classmates and the learning opportunities and stuff that you get, because the three years, three and a half years go by so quick. And, um, I think one of the things that I did that was different than my classmates was on my Instagram and how I grew to have a following was that every Every week, I would talk about my journey from week one all the way to week, whatever that was, um, on, on my journey of being a CRNA. So a lot of people got to follow and kind of see like, look, you can have kind of a social life while also studying a lot, while also learning. And so um, I, I definitely don't have any regrets about documenting all that because now I look back and I was like, wow, like that was, was crazy, crazy times. But um really good, good memories from it and, and good friends that came about from it too. All right. Can we please move on to the next slide? So I think in terms of advice, um, if you really want us to pursue the CRNA route, obviously you can hit me up on Instagram. I'm happy to chit chat with you uh, for more information, but it's super helpful to shadow someone that's in the field that you want to go to. So if you want to shadow a CRNA, um, you should probably shadow a couple people just to, so you're able to actually see what is it that they do? Does this look interesting? Does it kind of um, match the things that you find interesting, you know? And then you can also have, you know, one-on-one um, -on -one time with that person to ask more detailed questions. I had, I've had a couple people shadow me and I think it was beneficial for them. They told me later to just be able to see like, uh, what a day looks like, um, kind of like from the pre-op to the actual surgery and anesthesia time. And then after the surgery, post-op, like, what is it that I do? What's my scope of practice? Um, so I kind of recommend that no matter what field you're going into, just make sure you shadow a couple of people just to, to be able to get a better idea. Cause you might think like, Oh, like, let's say you want to be a doctor. That's great. Like you're like, okay, doctor, doctor, but the notion of being a doctor might only come from the movies you've seen or TV shows or what people have said, but until you actually shadow a doctor, it might be good for you to be able to see that person. Um, and then my second bullet point. Oh yeah. So what do you like to do? What are your strengths and weaknesses? You know, you got to be able to see how to use the things that you like into a job or kind of cater the things that you're good at and what you like into the career and a job that you want in the future. So being able to know who you are, um, like for me, I went from pharmacy to pre-med to nursing, and that took, I think, time for me to get to know myself. And I recommend you guys taking the time to do 
do that now as you're kind of in school and kind of getting a little glimpses of here and there like what is it that you like to do and what are you good at and then I'm all about making memories and uh, just you know taking advantage of the time that you have now because you won't ever get that back so make some friends sounds like you guys have a really good community a good network of people that you're already doing that with this club which is great I was never in a club like this so that's super cool and uh, you know you're gonna be studying and stuff but make some friends because you got to have fun too all right, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, and then next slide, please. <laughs> um, can you please go back to the slide before that? Give me one second. Um, I don't think... Can you please try again because I just um, that's all right. Um, so Victor, can you please share Nina's slides? And then while Victor is doing that, um, if you guys are have any questions, any comments, um, just please write them down for our Q&A session. I think there was a Google Form for that, right? Sorry, what was that? I think there was a Google Form for that, right? Um, well, there isn't a Google Form for the questions. We normally do those at the end of the session, um, but I just want to let you know that if you are having any questions right now, just write them down so that you don't forget them once we get to um, once we get to the end of the session. Yeah. But for the Google form, um, that's the sign in sheet. So please make sure that you do sign up. Uh, Nessa, can you see like the slides? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, so I kind of, I think some of the things I had already addressed in the previous um, slide. Oh, I'll just wait till. Okay, cool. Uh, so I, I kind of did the slideshow on the fly yesterday. So hopefully I'll address more of the questions that you guys might have. But so what is, what is a CRNA? We basically, I got this definition on, on the Google, we administer and provide anesthesia related care to patients before, during and after surgery and other procedures. And then we also work with other uh, medical people and act kind of as a advocate for the patient, especially when they're gonna be asleep and not able to advocate for themselves. So we're able to try and advocate for them um, regarding between them and the doctors or other leading care providers. We can scroll down to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna share a little bit about my story. Um, when I became a new grad nurse um, in the ICU, I actually, in 2015, one year after I graduated, I had some medical uh, problems and I actually um, ended up getting a huge like uh, tumor in my kidney. If you guys are interested in gross stuff, I can show you a picture of that later. Um, so I got this huge uh, tumor thing and I had to go to the hospital. That's just me in the hospital right there. And I... Um, you know, was admitted that I needed to have surgery because it was um, affecting my kidney to the point where I was having a lot of uh, symptoms like blood in my urine. I was having like blood clots about the size of my pinky and uh, urinary retention because the blood was um, blocking everything. And I had intense pain. And when they um, basically, you know, they did a CT scan and they were able to see that it was actually a tumor growing from my kidney. So I had surgery. One of the things they did for me in terms of anesthesia was put an epidural in. So that helped with pain relief because um, they actually had a cut. Uh, you can kind of see the scar I had on my, the picture on the top, right? They literally cut, cut through my, you know, my six pack of muscle there um, to get into the kidney out. And it was, it was so big. It weighed five pounds. 
And it wasn't until after they did the pathology report that they realized it was cancer. So I actually had kidney cancer. So I only have one kidney right now, but I had a lot of complications after um, the surgery kind of related to anesthesia actually. So um, kind of to make a long story short, um, while they put the epidural in, they have a medication, like numbing medicine that goes through the epidural catheter that helps to numb me kind of from um, kind of my mid abdomen downward, right? And that helps with pain control, especially because, you know, you just had surgery. And I remember the surgery was um, August 4. So the next day I woke up and I, I heard this beeping noise on the IV pool. So I look and the epidural bag is completely empty, which should not happen. That's like nursing 101. So um, they had to actually get another bag of medication for me, but it took 15 minutes for them to mix it. So meanwhile, I'm starting to get feeling back from my legs and it's working its way up and I'm like freaking out, right? I, I'm like, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna feel the pain. Like imagine having just had that surgery and now you're gonna have no pain relief at all. So I'm freaking out. I think they hit me with some Dilaudid and I pass out, but not before I felt the pain of basically being cut open and then I passed out. So I'm a weakling when it comes to pain medicine. So I pass out for a while. And somehow during the time that I was out, the anesthesiologist came and they gave me an extra dose of the numbing medicine in my epidural. He must have nicked my dura while placing the epidural because some of the medication ended up getting into like, I don't know, my cerebral spinal fluid with the spinal space. And I basically had these uh, seizure-like activity for the next three days that would last, I had six different episodes lasting from either two minutes to 15 minutes. And it would be sporadic, random, and uh, just kind of crazy. But the medication, it was ropivacaine and fentanyl combined. So um, ropivacaine is a type of local anesthetic. And one of the effects, if it gets into like the cerebral spinal fluid and stuff is that it can actually cause you to have seizure like activity. So um, it takes about two to three days for it to get out of the system, which is why it makes sense why I had that seizure like activity for um, over the course of the three days. And so when that happened, I just realized my anesthesia was kind of bad. You know, afterwards, I eventually recovered after like a week being in the hospital, I was able to leave and you can kind of see when I get home, like, I'm using a walker because I mean, you just had this five pound tumor out. So my body was a little like lopsided and I had a lot of support, uh, family, and friends who were able to be there. But I told myself, like, um, I think at the time, I didn't think I was smart enough or good enough to be a CRNA. It was like an advanced nursing position. So I never thought about being a CRNA until this happened to me. And then I was like, I think I can provide better anesthesia than the anesthesia I received. And I want to be able to be there for people who are going through surgery because I went through surgery and I know what it's like. So that's my path into becoming a CRNA. It wasn't something I always wanted to do. It actually came about because of my cancer that happened. So that's like the gist of part of my testimony. Um, but you can scroll down. So I believe in God and I believe that he saved my life. So that I freaking lived my life up. Like I made a bucket list. I went like skydiving, uh, parasailing I saw Adele in concert I traveled went on a cruise you know just like all this stuff and the the so I'm a puzzler and you'll see the that puzzle picture that's a 32,000 piece puzzle that I completed in in uh the De the December so four months after I um uh, had my surgery and stuff I had plenty of time at home I was recovering for about two months at home so I was able to um Kind of finish up that puzzle then so it's just kind of cool i still try and have that yolo mentality when it comes to living life but also be a responsible adult and like you know uh so i am actually um seven and a half years cancer free now since that happened and i praise god for that every day but uh that's kind of what got me into this mentality of trying to like be the best that i can be and and uh, god's just been with me throughout the whole journey too so that's my story. Um, and then, uh, so obviously God saved my life. And I was like, I can't, there's nothing to lose. I might as well apply to school, you know, and I only applied to one school, which I don't recommend. I think you should apply multiple schools, but I just applied to Loma Linda. Um, I'm Seventh-day Adventist and it was a Seventh-day Adventist school. And I thought it might be good to have a spiritual community with me while I go through the three hardest years of my life in school. And I actually got accepted, um, got the interview, 
kind of struggled through that. I mean, essentially the interview for CRNA school, it's made in a way to see how you deal with stress. So I had 12 people <laughs> at the interview. So you come in, there's 12 people looking at you and you're just like, great. You sit down and people start asking you questions. They ask you um, what I call smart people questions, which is all the technical stuff about like kind of ICU related things. Like what does this medication do? And what would you do in this situation? What about a code blue? You know, all this stuff. And then they ask you personality questions, which I like because I'm better at answering those. That's like, do you work well with others? Like kind of teammate uh, or uh, kind of teamwork with your teammates and um, workmates and stuff. Like uh, you show that off, like how do you deal with stress? Are you resilient? You know, kind of the gauging your personality as well as your, you know, smart people answer to the questions. Um, so I, I made it through that process a month after the interview I got accepted. So then I moved from Oregon to California and this was like about five five, six years ago or something. And then, so I started it in, um, yeah, 2017. And these are some of my other classmates that also made it through the interview and stuff. So that was the beginning. Yep. We can get to the next slide. So then I start talking about, if you guys want to be a CRNA, what do you have to do? So I actually have a picture of when, when I passed my boards, I show that I was a certified registered nursing assistant in 2010. I got my bachelorette. Well, I say bachelorette, but it was a bachelor's in 2014. And then I graduated in 2020. So it actually took about 10 years for my journey from being a, an assistant to getting my master's degree. So usually it takes about three to four years to get a bachelor's of science in, in actual nursing school. And then after that, you have to work as an ICU nurse for one to two years. Uh, you need that critical care experience and um, the assessment skills that come from working that job in order to become a good CRNA. And then once that happens, um, oh, I just put, you should probably get a CCRN certification test. It's just um, another way to kind of stand out a little bit more. I think most people have that by the time they apply for CRNA school. Um, it's just a critical care, nurse, like registered nursing certification. So it's just another test that you take to get that, those four initials on the end of your name. I think at the time I applied to school, I was like, I was like Nina, BSN, CCRN, you know, so the more letters, the better. And, and then once you get into CRNA school, that takes about three to four years. So it does, it, it's a bit of a journey. I know for me, it took 10 years, depending on where you guys are at, you know, um, but it's okay. Like I, there is a, one of my classmates, he was probably the oldest one. So I was the youngest in my class. Um, but one of the ones who were more, who was older, he actually was a nurse for like, I want to say like nine, 10 years, but he decided to go back to school and he worked so hard. He had a family and he sacrificed a lot, but he's a great CRNA now. And so there is no like time frame per se, but if you really want to do it um, and you have that driven mindset, then, then you can do it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I kind of talked about this already in the um, previous slides, but, you know, shout out some CRNAs, find out your strengths. And also figure out why you want to pursue something. Do you want to do it because you want the money? Because that might not be a good enough reason, you know? Uh, do you want to do it because you want a, a nice schedule? Again, they're like, dig deep in your heart. Like, what? why do you want to pursue something, you know? Uh, the generic answer is that you want to help people, which is true and great. But I think when you, especially when you're going through the interview process for CRNA school, Everyone has the same answers. You have to make yourself stand out by having a unique story. And I happen to have my cancer story, but I don't obviously recommend you all. Not everyone has cancer and I, I don't wish that on anyone, but um, there's got to be like a, a good reason for why you want to get to CRNA school and you got to think about that. Um, obviously, uh, depending on where you guys are at right now, you do prereqs for nursing school. You get into the ICU if you can as a new grad nurse. If you can't, then I recommend um, working where you can in the hospital and then transferring into the ICU. I've had friends do that. Um, apply to multiple schools and then do your best during the interview. So we can scroll down, thank you. I also mentioned this already, but in the hospital you can do eight, 10, 12, 14, 24 hour shifts. Um, I also work at an outpatient surgery center and I'm usually done earlier. So usually at the earliest like one, at the latest, maybe five. The other 
earlier this week, I actually got done at 730, which is a 13 hour shift, which is not common. But most of the time outpatient surgery centers, they have healthier patients and the surgeries are pretty quick. So they're able to kind of recover a bit and they don't have to stay overnight all the time. So they can just go home. That's the outpatient surgery center. Um, I mentioned that I average 40, 40, 48 hours a week. Um, this week, I'm doing a bit more than that. It just happened to be like that. So it's not always evenly spaced out, but that's kind of the average, at least for my work schedule. We do anesthesia for all sorts of stuff. Um, we actually do, there are heart surgeries, cardiac surgeries, but they have a cardiac anesthesiologist that's specially trained for that. So I actually do not do those procedures and I would not want to do those procedures. Um, but, you know, I'll do anesthesia for anyone who has like a spine surgery, some uh, brain surgery, like any cranies, you know, um, robotic cases, laparoscopic, plastics, ortho, a ton of ortho cases, you know, a total hip, total knee, total shoulder replacement, all that stuff. There's GI cases, there's OB with C-sections, um, you know, vascular cases, there's a ton. And I kind of mentioned, you can, you can work a little bit everywhere. If there's any kind of procedure or surgery that needs anesthesia, we can do that. And uh, I think I've touched on this too, where you want to work depends on what, like, do you want certain skills to keep up with? Or do you want the schedule? Do you want, you know, a location? So it, uh, your preferences kind of determine where you want to work, but it's not hard to get a job. I'll say that right now. Oh no, I think my uh, slide didn't quite go through. So uh, there's different types of anesthesia. Most people know of general anesthesia, which is when you're completely asleep. And I actually have to either put um, a ET tube, which is on the left on the picture, or an LMA, which is just like a, it's like a soft airway device that goes behind your tongue. It's not a secure airway the way the ET tube is, but um, it basically can breathe for you with those tools that we place after the patient's completely asleep. So that's general anesthesia. Um, there's also regional, which is when you do a spinal or epidural and the patients can be awake for that and stay awake. Cause once you're numb, like, you know, from, um, like for a spinal, that's usually from the waist down epidural. That's usually kind of like, um, T4 level, which is like, I don't know, like boob level down. There's also peripheral nerve blocks, which I think the word got cut off, but that's when I can, um, let's say you're having a, a shoulder, uh, procedure being done. There is a way for me to use an ultrasound machine and inject numbing medicine close by the nerves that supply your shoulder and kind of the rest of your arm. And that can be numb for like 10 to 12 hours that helps with pain relief after the surgery. So that's another type of anesthesia that we can do. We can also numb um, parts of the abdomen, uh, parts of the leg. You know, we can't numb everything, but there's a lot of extremities we can do in the abdomen that helps with pain control. And then the last thing I put is local. Sometimes they just want um, to do, it's a little surgery and you don't need to do general, you don't need to do other stuff. So it's technically the name is monitored anesthesia care, which is MAC for short, like a big MAC, M-A-C. And that's just when I give essentially like some Versed, some, so they don't remember, maybe some fentanyl for some. Why are you trolling them, bro? Huh? Uh... So, um, they, they give, so some, you know, Versed to help them not remember, and then some fentanyl for pain. And then I'll actually use purple fall to kind of get them a little bit sleepy, but they're still breathing on their own. And that's, um, kind of another way to do anesthesia. So they don't always have to have that breathing tube in them or anything like that. Um, so there's just different types of anesthesia and not, it's not always like something that everyone's aware of. So I like to educate people, be like, you know, you don't have to be asleep for this necessarily. I can actually get you comfortable. You can be breathing on your own, but you won't know what's going on. So there's like certain things that you can do and mix and match. So I was going to do kind of like a, what do you think we should do? I don't know. This is like an interactive part, but I was like, okay, a patient's having a total knee replacement. What kind of anesthesia do you think they'll do? You know, I don't know if people want to answer or I can just talk about it. Um, so if you're having a total knee replacement, you can have general, which is when you have that breathing tube, or you can have a spinal, you know, um, which is, you know, I poke them in the back, they're numb from the waist down. And then I also then do a peripheral nerve block. I block part of their knee to allow for pain control afterwards. And then I do the monitored anesthesia care. I give them propofol so they sleep. So that's a three-part thing I can do, which is one of my favorite things to do 
for those total hips and total knee replacements. But you can, let's say they don't want to be poked in the back. That's fine. I'll just, just, just do general anesthesia and put a breathing tube in. Um, if a patient's having a C-section, what are some options? You know, they, if it's an emergency C-section, um, it's not ideal, but you can intubate the patient. Obviously they won't be able to be awake to see their baby, but if there's some problem happening, which I've had to do a couple of times, you just intubate them and they got to get baby out. If it's a scheduled C-section, then I'll just do a spinal again, they, they get numb and, uh, you know, they're able to be awake, able to see baby, and it's all good. If they already have an epidural in place, I can just dose up the epidural to a good level so that they won't feel the cut when they um, do the incision for the C-section. And that's another option too. Um, you know, if they're having a robotic hysterectomy, the only safe option for that is general anesthesia. Um, there's a little bit more I can talk about later as to why we wouldn't just do a spinal for that case, but uh, you have to have... Um, a uh, breathing tube essentially for the robotic cases. And then uh, same thing for like, um, if you're having your lower back being worked on and there's a fusion, um, for those procedures, the patient, there are different positions that a patient can be in for surgery. They're not just always on their back. Sometimes they're on their stomach. Sometimes they're on their side. Sometimes they're sitting up and that happens after they're asleep. So for the lower back to get to there, you have to have the patient actually on their stomach. So the safest anesthesia for them would actually to be under general anesthesia, which is breathing tube. So I'm able to control their breathing. Um, that way when they're on their stomach, then uh, I can still provide safe anesthesia and then they're able to do the surgery. And then when the surgery is done, we flip them back onto their back and then I wake them up and get rid of the tube. So yeah, that's kind of just going through some of the things that you think about. It's not just a, you know, cut and dry general anesthesia for everyone. I think less is more. So there's an option where I don't have to do general anesthesia. I would usually offer that to the patient and see if they're okay with that. And I, that's all I had. All right. Thank you so much. That was very nice and informal. For, sorry. Um, I wanted to apologize about the little, I try to monitor, I try my best to monitor it, but sometimes, um, yeah. So now we can move move on to the Q&A section. Um, if you guys do have any questions, please paste them in the chat. Um, but one question that we do ask almost every single guest speaker um, that comes on here is, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? How do you deal with the stress? And where do you find motivation um, to just you know go through so many schooling, so many work and studying? Oh, geez. Imposters. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that fake it till you make it thing is real. I think. Um, <laughs> so, so I learned as an ICU nurse to kind of not show my stresses too much because as an anesthesia provider, if I freak out, everyone freaks out. So I actually had an emergent um, procedure I had to do yesterday it was everyone's freaking out, but I had to stay calm. But in my head, if you could hear my inner thoughts, I was like yelling, screaming. I'm like, oh no, no, no. But um, you kind of learn to compartmentalize everything. I learned that actually by being a nurse because like, you know, let's say a, a patient ends up coding and they end up dying. You can't just break down and cry there. You have stuff you have to do. You have to be there for the family members. You have to work through the process of how, what do we do now, you know? And I actually would usually wait till after my shift and then I would cry. So crying, I still, you know, if it's a really bad day, I still cry. That's a healthy way to cope. I think you just have to wait till after <laughs> afterwards. I talk a lot with my friends and um, my family. I usually vent to them if I'm having a really hard day. And for me, I had really great classmates where we're going through the same stuff. We're all going through imposter syndrome. So we would actually open up and be like, hey, how was your day? Oh, it actually wasn't good. What happened? And we would kind of share it. And that solidarity helped us to be able to cope with things. So don't think you're ever doing something alone. Actually, as you open up and talk with other people who are going through the same thing, you realize everyone's dealing with the same stuff you are. You just don't realize that because no one, you know, you don't post about that on social media. You don't like talk about it all the time. It's something that people hide, but if you're able to be open about that, you'll find that other people are going to be open back with you. And that's helpful too. And uh, of course, I'm spiritual. So I pray about it. And I talk to God about it too. Um, but I, I find that 
being open and honest is a policy that will help not only in relationships, but professionally speaking, when you're trying to like op be open and honest with your patient about the, you know, complications that can happen or other options that they have. You're open and honest with the surgeon that you're working with or, you know, um, and then with your classmates, with, you know, your friends and everything too. So um, I find that that was really helpful, but we all struggle. I feel like now I'm more confident three years later, I'm more confident in my abilities where I can be like, yeah, I actually think I am decent at what I'm doing, but I'm still like a baby CRNA. Some people say you're still like a baby until like five years. So I'm like, whatever. I don't know. I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I still am constantly humbled. You know, you'll have days when you're like, yeah, like I rock. Everything is great. And the next day you'll miss all your IVs. All your patients have complications. You're like, am I the problem? Is it me? Like what's wrong? And so I, I think it's a real thing that everyone struggles with, but you have to give yourself some slack. You have to think about where you came from. Like, what have you overcome in your past? What has God helped you overcome? What is your family, your friends? What have you overcome like through your own persistence? And you have to give yourself slack and be like, you know what? I'm actually in school now. I'm learning all this great stuff. You're in a good place, you know? And um, eventually you'll get there. But that imposter syndrome is a real thing got to give yourself slack and try and get a community of people around you who are kind of going through the same thing, you know, and just be open about it. I think that's going to be most helpful to you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and then we have a, or a few questions in the chat. Um, uh, ne ne Neha said that, how did you realize that you wanted to be a CRNA and what helped you make that decision? Um, I think she did join in a little bit later, so she might have missed your whole little story. If you okay, like yeah, I'll just do a brief. <laughs> um, I had kidney cancer. I was in the hospital. I had okay anesthesia, and I think I had some complications from it. And I realized after God saved my life and gave me a second chance, I was like, I was always held back from applying because you know it's like CRNA school. It's so hard and. A lot of people talk about how difficult it is. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm smart enough or good enough. But when you get a second chance at life, everything else just becomes so small. And so I just decided, oh, what the hell, I'll apply. And so I applied and I got in. And once I got in, I was like 100% committed to completing it. I cannot fail. I thought that was a sign that I needed to be a CRNA. And I think I'm able to be put in a position where God can better use me to help other people when they're struggling with the vulnerability, especially when going to surgery. And because of my experience, I know how painful it is to have an IV. I know what it's like to have a Foley catheter in me. I know what it's like to, to be nervous. You know, me and my brother's going to touch you. <laughs> so um, I think hopefully that answered the question. But I, I knew just because of my own personal experience that once I got accepted, that was kind of a sign because it's so hard to get into school. And I just kind of went for it. And I don't look back at all. No regrets. <laughs> all right thank you for sharing that um i think someone had their hand raised you can go ahead and ask your question uh so my question is when you were a cna versus um now that you're a crna that you feel like people treated you differently because um i'm a cna right now and i feel like a lot of people they treat cna like really badly compared to like everyone else Yes, yes. It's amazing what one letter does <laughs> to your respect. I'm like, I worked hard for that R, man, <laughs> and that CRNA. Um, as a CNA, I you kind of do like, I mean, kudos to you, man. Like, I know uh, looking back at the CNA days, you're like doing a lot of like, I don't know, you're like wiping butts. You're like, you know, taking care of the patient, and do, and which is all necessary. You know, I totally get that. And I do think as you kind of get um, the more and more education and like you get a little bit more respect as a nurse, get a little bit more respect as a CRNA. As soon as I tell people I do get anesthesia, it's kind of crazy how like their like mindsets shifts and they treat you a little bit different. I'm just like, oh, well, I'm still the same person as when I was a CNA to now as an anesthesia provider. But you're right. There is definitely like a respect thing, which is horrible because I think CNAs are great and you guys are needed too. So it's just kind of like, I think society's perception of what's successful. They don't always, they think like the, like the more money you make, you know, the more successful you are. But I think for patient care, 
you know, CNAs, uh, LPNs, RNs, I mean, everyone were kind of all working together to help the patient. So I do agree though, my respect has, or people respecting me has gone way up <laughs> since I became a CRNA, but I love CNA. So I still respect you guys. Thank you. Um, also for the prereqs, when you apply to CNA, CRNA school, was it different or like, um, did you have to take any extra classes? Oh, let me try and think. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at the prereqs. There were some things that I think had um, expired because some of us took a while to get back to school. So they required like um, a statistics class, which I we don't use at all. We're not flipping a coin to make sure, like, see, you have a 50-50 shot to see if you have anesthesia. We're not using statistics. So um, there are certain things that they required part of like the master's degree that um for prereqs, I was able to, to actually do uh like the summer before and like stuff like that. So um, because I had a religion school, so we had to do religion classes. We had statistics. There was some, um, some was there a math thing as well or other math thing? And like, um, yeah, so I think in terms of prereqs, that will be more like becoming or um, having a nursing degree and stuff is the biggest prereq. And then from there, you just make sure that most of the classes work. Because if you've already done those classes for nursing school, they should be able to work. school. It's been a while since obviously I graduated, but every school I noticed had different requirements. So if you apply to like three or four different CRNA schools, you should check and see. It's not a standardized application, unfortunately, which I think is dumb. But um, each school is going to require something different. Like someone might want OCHEM. Don't know why, but sure. You know, and someone wants statistics. Someone wants, so I think it has to do with their degree requirements more than the actual CRNA application part, you know, like applying it to your job. So that's something you're going to have to research depending on the schools that you want to go to and see like, oh, prereq wise, like what works, what doesn't. But usually the school, the classes that you do for a nursing degree usually should be fine. All right, and then we have another question in the chat, and it's uh, it asks about how your first um, interaction or experience with the patient was. <laughs> oh yeah, um, so I didn't. Have, <laughs> um, so we finished a uh, white coat ceremony, and then we all go to uh, clinicals, and we all get paired with the preceptor. I think my preceptor didn't like me. <laughs> and so uh, she, it was actually a really bad first day for me because I'm trying to show that I'm learning, but you know, you're kind of like that imposter syndrome was so real. I was like, oh my goodness, like, can I like touch? I, I know I'm a nurse, but it's like, it's been a while. And I think I was trying to give some medication and she's like, you're doing it too slow. She took the the syringe from my hand, the preceptor and just like gave the medication for me. And I was just like, this is going to be a great day. <laughs> and then um, I got to actually try to intubate the, or actually you're supposed to be able to try and intubate the patient. So prior to um, clinicals, being able to intubate a real patient, we had practiced hours on a mannequin in the um, like sim lab, where we kind of practice going through things before we actually go in real clinicals. So I had practice on a mannequin and I was so excited because I was like, great, she's going to let me try. It was going to be my first time. Well, I lied. She didn't let me try. <laughs> so she's like, you're just going to watch. Um, <laughs> so she said, you're just going to watch today. And I was like horrified. So we get back, we get back to class, you know, and afterwards we have like a little debrief with the classroom. And my teacher was like, how was everyone's first day? Who got to try and intubate? Literally everyone raised their hand <laughs> except for me. <laughs> so it was a horrible first day. But I had a better preceptor um, the next day and they were able to help me try to intubate. And then gradually your confidence builds because there's always going to be a first time for everything, right? And uh, so my, I think my first interaction with that patient, I'm trying to like do a pre-op assessment, which I'm better at now, but you know, you're just like, hi, I'm Nina, I'm learning to do anesthesia and what's your airway look like? And do you have heart problems? Yeah, like it was very like, I wasn't very confident element because you're, you know, the preceptor's right there. And like I said, I'm pretty sure she hated me. So it was just very hard to talk to the patient and having someone there immediately uh, makes you feel like you don't know what you're doing. Cause you know, like if, if I was by myself, they don't, 
they don't know like I'm necessarily a student so I can like talk to them but if you have someone there they're kind of auto automatically the patient automatically like kind of distrust you a little bit so I think I had to deal with that for the beginning part until I was able to actually like verbalize things better and then you know show them like now I actually even though I have experience because I look so young you know Asian don't raise them so uh people will actually be like oh like do how old are you do you know what you're doing I was like yes I know how to do anesthesia and I explain the process to them and then the patients normally trust me after that um most of the time they trust me already but there's always a few people that they're like this girl looks like 12 and she doesn't <laughs> she's like just graduated high school I don't know so I have to explain to them and show them like I actually know what I'm doing and I'll take care of them. So that's kind of the struggle that I have sometimes now. But yes, my first interaction to now, huge difference, <laughs> way more confidence, not a very good first day in clinicals. <laughs> that's a good question. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I feel like when you first do try something, you, you're always like very nervous. So, yeah. you know, and then having... um you know, having like people that aren't as supportive, especially as like advisors or preceptors. Yeah. Um, moving on, we have another question in the chat um, or a few questions is what major did you choose for undergrad? Is it better to choose a general major over a more specialized? And does one prepare you more for nursing medical CRNA school? Honestly, um because nursing is its own field, having a major in nursing is pretty much all you need. You don't have to do like a minor in something. Um, I think with med school, it's different. You know, you can major in biology and get to med school. You can major in something else. But for nursing, once you major in nursing, there's no like, you don't have to minor in anything. Um, and you'll see like, once you start doing nursing, like once you get to nursing school and you start seeing the kind of classes that they, um, they have you do, then you'll be able to see like, oh, like these are, kind of more situ uh, suited for being a nurse and stuff. So those nursing specific classes are more in nursing school. Um, I don't know if there's any like specific majors that would help you with that. Just as long as you pick nursing as your major, I think that's the only thing. There's no like, you don't have to do other stuff and then get into nursing per se. Because usually prereqs for nursing school take about, I want to say a couple, maybe one or two years. Um, so during that time, you can start doing, it took me a couple years to do prereqs for nursing school. Um, and you can kind of tell, like, if you don't like those prereqs, require, like anatomy and physiology, if you don't like that, you probably won't like nursing or really healthcare, maybe. So there's just certain ones, like as you're doing prereqs, you're like, okay, like this is, you you like it, you're good at it. Or you're like, okay, this is cool. This in interests me still. I think that's a good indicator that nursing could be good for you um, and just have nursing as your major. There's no... No, no other requirement for that. Yeah, thank you. The question. Yeah. Um, and then what kind of qualities would make a good CRNA and what are some steps that you can take to avoid a burnout? Mm, okay. So I can tell you like being smart is not the only thing you need because the, the class ahead of me actually had three, was it three, three people drop out of CRNA school for different reasons. Most, uh, mostly because I think personality actually plays a part to it. So when they start interviewing you, that's why they ask you smart people questions and personality stuff. You have to be a good team player. You're going to be working with some mean surgeons occasionally. You're going to be working with people who are hard to work with, but you have to be professional and be able to work with all sorts of people. Uh, number two, you have to be able to advocate for your patient. The patient's asleep. They're not able to advocate for themselves. So if you don't think something's safe for them or something is not right, you have to speak up. So being able to have that integrity, I think it's important. Um, in terms of going through like school and the hard days, um, emotional resiliency is super important. Um, when something bad happens, are you able to bounce back like a rubber band and, and try and like, you know, brush it off as best you can? You learn from the past, you learn from your mistakes, but you have to keep going forward. So that's kind of emotionally, are you able to do that? I think that's a really important trait. Um, this is just kind of extra stuff on top of obviously knowing like the the smarts and the education part. Um, and obviously like um, also being able to be flexible, I think is key. Um, things can happen immediately. So you have to like, when I worked at the trauma hospital, sometimes I'll get ready for one case and oh no, a gunshot wound to the abdomen came in. Great, I gotta like drop what I'm doing and try and prepare for that emergent case you know um so you have to be flexible if something requires you to 
do something emergently, you got to go do do it. Um, also being able to critically think quickly. If an emergency happens, you can usually ask for help, right? You ask for another anesthesia provider to come in. That can take minutes, which can cost someone their life. So if there's an emergency happening, you have to be able to deal with it. Is there airway? Or is there a laryngeal spasm? Is there a bronchospasm? You got to be able to allow them to breathe, right? Um, so you got to deal with that. Is there is there <clears throat> blood pressure super low? And it's like, you know, you got to make sure you get the medication to be able to fix that, you know? Do they have no pulse? Bring again on the chest and like do CPR, you know? Like, so there's different things you have to be able to like critically think fast um, on top of being flexible and kind of the other things I mentioned personality wise, like working well with others, um, emotional resiliency. Those are some of the ones. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry, I forgot. Um, I believe the second part of the question was what are some steps that you can take to avoid a burnout? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm, I think, so I talk a lot and honestly, for me, talking it out helps, but think of the coping skills that you already possess. Do you typically journal? Do you go for a walk out in nature? Do you talk it out as well? Like, you know, or do you have a hobby that you do that helps you to kind of like de-stress? I think having those kind of coping mechanisms in place now will be able to help you not just for CRNA school, if you want to do that, but just for any area of your life when you're going through stress, because if you don't cope with it, you're just burying it and it's going to build and build and build until you do get completely burnt out and you want to quit. And like, you know, so, so being able to cope with things as they happen and everyone's different. So just knowing what your coping mechanism is will be helpful. Um, I think that will help you. So for me, I talk a lot. So that helps me to talk it through, but I also run. I also go outdoors. I puzzle a lot. So, you know, there's like, everyone has different things that they do. And once you kind of figure out what your coping mechanism is, I think you should be able to, to consistently work on having a habit of doing that because you don't want things to just like be buried. Now you're just avoiding the problem. It's better to kind of face it on before it becomes a bigger thing because small things will add up to something big. So just make sure you have a coping mechanism in place now. All right, thank you for sharing that. Another question we had in the chat is, can you share any memorable experiences that have had a significant impact on your career as a CRNA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a couple. <laughs> let me think. They're all like <laughs> bad stories though. So let me think. Okay, well, I'll share, I'll share the worst, the worst one, I guess. Um, so I had to take over for a cardiac anesthesiologist. Um, he was doing a thoracic case. It was a lung case. They were towards the end, and all I had to do was wake up the patient, right? So uh, there's a couple steps to waking up the patient. Um, you have to, there are three things that will keep a patient asleep if they're still paralyzed. So you want to reverse the paralytic. If they have too much pain medicine or narcotics on board, you have to make sure you, you don't overdo that. And if they still have anesthesia gas on board. So how you wake up a patient is if they're paralyzed, you can give reversal. And we happen to have a great drug called Sugamidex, which is great for reversing the, uh, rocaronium, which is a paralytic that we use, um, Usually we don't give too much narcotics during the case. So that wasn't an issue. And then you turn off the anesthesia gas and you let the patient kind of breathe it off when they're able to wake up and breathe on their own. And then that's what I removed the breathing tube. So as I'm kind of going through this process, he gives me a very subpar report on the patient. I don't know much about it, but that they're sick. So I start looking and their uh, pulse ox um, isn't reading. That's a, that's a way to tell the oxygen levels for the patient. And it just like, it wasn't working when I came into the room to, to take over for the doctor. And so I was like, oh, that's not good. That's weird. The finger it was kind of cold, right? So I'm like, hey, I asked the nurse to try and, you know, problem solve that. Meanwhile, um, I do everything, all the things I mentioned to wake up the patient and the patient's not breathing like on their own. So I'm still breathing for them with the ventilator. And I'm like, this is odd, you know, this, and, and the patient's looking real kind of gray at this point. I don't know what the normal color was. I came in at the end. I was like, this doesn't seem right. So I asked for some help. I'm still breathing for the patient. And meanwhile, um, someone comes in and we're checking for a pulse and there's no pulse. So this patient was probably dying maybe as I was going into the room, um, you know? So so we start CPR, we get the code, you know, we bring everyone in. I think we code the guy for, I don't know if it was 30 minutes to... An hour. I can't. I can't remember anymore. It was very. 
everything happened so fast. But the patient, long story short, ended up dying. So I think looking back, um, I don't know if there was um, like something that obstructed the uh, ET tube. Maybe the patient had a heart attack. Maybe like, I'm not sure actually, but that was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. This was within six months of being a CRNA. Life was good. I thought I had everything. And, and then this happened, right? So of course, like I'm horrified at this. This is, you know, deaths in the OR in the operating room don't typically happen. So for me, I was like, oh my goodness, like this is mind blowing. I had to actually leave, you know, uh, once every, all the code was done. Um, I had to leave and kind of like take a breather and kind of cry a little bit. Cause I just, it was so such a shock. I couldn't deal with it. Like I couldn't shut it down like I normally do. Um, and then gradually I came back, had to finish the charting, kind of did some debriefing with the anesthesiologist who was in charge that day. And we were able to talk it through. And I think there was so many things that happened that could have been prevented. You know, maybe I shouldn't have given that guy a break at the end. Maybe he should have woken up the patient himself. Maybe there were some things he should have told me. So I am aware that this patient actually was, you know, maybe low blood pressure the whole time. Like there was just so many things. And maybe I should have been better at being able to find the pulse quickly versus like problem solving. Cause normally the patients are alive when I take over. So I was not expecting that, you know? So now because of that happening, actually I'm more particular about when I take over for a patient, um, where I work now, the patients aren't as sick, but there are still sick patients. So I'm very particular. I make sure they give me a better report, especially before I take over. Um, if something does happen like that, I know to check the pulse right away now, just in case. I'm kind of paranoid about that. Um, and just in terms of like, you know, I beat myself up for a long time because I kept thinking it was my fault that the patient died, but the patient was really sick. There was a lot of things happening um, physiologically to the patient that I didn't know about. Like maybe the patient was going to die later, like after the surgery. I don't know. The surgery wasn't like a, a benign one either. It's a lung surgery, you know? So there were a lot of things that I had to work through with that, but I'm just sharing like the worst experience I've had. Um, but from that experience, I was able to kind of be like, well, how can I not have this happen again? So that's where for me, like I'm particular about safety things when it comes to the patient, including like information. Like if I want to take over, you have to tell me the important things. How was the case? What's the patient's blood pressure been? Is this new? What's this, you know? Um, so I'm more particular about that. Um, and, uh, other things that have happened that have shaped, like, so we all have different routines and habits that we do in our job. I'm very uh, OCD about how I set things up. I, I have certain drugs that I will never give. I have certain things that I will always give. And so things, as bad things happen, you start to mold your practice because of your experiences. So how I do anesthesia is going to be different than how she does anesthesia or how he does it because they've had different experiences that shape it. There are so many ways to do anesthesia, but I find that each little experience I have, there's, it sets you up for like, how do I not do this again? And then you start, even if it's not your fault, even if it's a system error or, or the other person's fault or something, you still try and figure out how do I prevent this from happening to the patient again? Because in the end, you're there for the patient and you care about them. So I'm really big on patient safety stuff. Um, because of that, but that's like the worst experience. So don't judge me on that, but yes, that's the worst one I've ever had to go through. All right. Thank you for sharing that. I know, um, it can be a little difficult to talk about experiences like that. Um, but before we end today's meeting, we have just one more question and that is what keeps you going and is it possible, is it passion or personal strength? Hmm. How, well, Probably both, I guess. Um, I What keeps me going a lot at work, even when I have a bad day, are the people I work with, you know? Um, I like making people uh, happy. I try and be positive and people really like that. And they try and do the same thing back. So it's a lot of like, I love the people I work with. It's such a great community. I joke with them. We laugh about stuff, you know? Sometimes we hang out outside of work. And so for me, even when you have a bad day, you know? Uh, you, if you have surround yourself with people and I was super blessed to have a great work environment throughout all my working experiences, actually, as a ICU nurse, as a CNA, I had great people I worked with there um, as a CRNA in both of my jobs that I've been to. So maybe I was super lucky. Maybe you just kind of attract what you are, you know, like, like attracts like. So as you kind of develop that positive 
um, attitude of just like trying to do your best and bring happiness and stuff to other people or just like showing that you have a good work ethic, I think those people will be attracted to you and that community will start to build where you're at. So for me, um, that helps me a lot when I'm at work. And then I do like a ton of fun stuff outside of work and that keeps me going because I do not, um, I don't uh, live to work. I, well, what is it? How does it go? I don't work all the time. I don't want to just work. I want to live. So for me, it's a lot of like, all right, like I'm going to do something fun this weekend or, or tomorrow on my day off, I'm going to like go on a hike or do this puzzle or like, you know, hang out with people and watch this movie. You know, it's just silly stuff like that. I think helps me go on a vacation. Um, so there's a lot of things that I have in place at work and outside of work that helps me to keep going. And I think it's, um, there's probably passion in it too, because I do love what I do. I love being able to share about it. I love helping people on my Instagram. I have people ask me often like, Hey, what are some tips about CRNA school and stuff? And I'm always happy to help. Um, and then I don't know about personal strength. I don't really think I'm a strong person, but I think I've been through a lot in my life. That's allowed me to have that emotional resiliency. That's been able to help me at work. Yeah, I think it's important to find the healthy balance between life and then work. And then one question that me and the officers have is kind of silly is what kind of songs do you play in the OR? Oh, <laughs> uh, so we play songs based on the surgeon preference. So like there's a doctor I work with. It's like in the club, like it's just hopping, popping music. It's super loud. I'm like, I can barely hear anything. <laughs> So he likes that kind of music. There's some doctor who doesn't like any sound. It's super boring in his room. Uh, there's one guy that likes Christian music all the time. There's one that likes country. I hate country. So I don't like that room, um, you know, and there was like, so it's kind of doctor preference. Um, a lot of the times it tends to be like, like Z100, like top 40 hits, something like that, like pop songs and stuff. Um, sometimes there's like hardcore, like metal uh, rock music, which I, I can only handle so much of that. So then I usually ask them like, hey, can we switch to something different, you know? Um, but where I work, actually the nurses help to do the music. Sometimes anesthesia is in charge of music too. But um, yeah, sometimes, usually the nurses are. So it's kind of surgeon preference. We cater to the doctors a lot. All right, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming today and sharing your journey with us. Um, we very appreciate it. And I wanted to apologize for um, the disruptions. Um, so before we let you go today, um, I wanted to take a picture for our website and social media. Um, Victor, if you can please. All right, um, so if you guys are comfortable with um, being on Instagram or on our website, you can, um, you can turn your video on. And then I will just do a three, two, one, and then take a picture. All right. Um, okay. Wait, I'm sorry. Are we uh, not taking any more questions? Um, yeah, we have to end the meeting. Yeah. Oh, for sure. No worries. Okay. You so can, um, contact me later on Instagram if you want, or I could stay a little bit behind the meeting just to, if you have another question. Oh, yeah. I'll stick around. I don't exactly. I uh, have social media, but yeah, 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 I'll stick around. Thank you. Okay, okay, yeah. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, let's take our picture. Um, one, two, three. Okay, I think, I think that was enough pictures. Um, and then, uh, if you have any questions for Nina, um, you can additional questions you can put them in the chat right now before we let her go because the time is coming to an end all right thank you so much nina for um joining us today we really appreciate it um i can for nina's contact info yeah i can share that later on in the chat but nina you are free to go <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um for this is Nina's Instagram. If you guys want to follow her, I think it's N squared. Um
And then just wanted to let you know that our officer application form is due tonight at 1159 p.m. And make sure you fill out the sign out form. If an officer can please paste that in the chat. Our word of the day is propofil. Um, and then once you do fill out- oh, the Also, because um, I know a few people in this um, meeting apply to be an officer. So if you have any questions right now, you can also ask the officer if you um, have any questions about like the position. So if you have any questions regarding our officer applications, positions, or anything like that, you can let us know. Um, yeah, Po? Oh yeah, I was gonna ask, since the application's like, oh, what's your first primary, secondary, like position you're applying for? Mm -hmm. Like, do we have to do every single mock challenge for each position? No, no. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Um, you can go ahead with your first, um, you can go ahead and do the mock challenge for your first, uh, or for your preferred. Yeah. And then, uh, Neha? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, like all of you, like you've, you've done a great job and this was such a good experience. Like this is my first time attending a meeting for MOA and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Yeah, and also, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thank you for joining us today. Yeah, um, so I, I was actually wondering, like, uh, does one have to be a De Anza student to be eligible for applying for these positions? Because I'm, I'm a student at Foothill. Um, I... Uh, yeah, so you do need to be a De Anza student because um, I think it asks for like your ID or something when you um, apply like for the school to like know that you're an officer. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's what I thought. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll keep attending as many uh, events as possible because I think you guys are doing such a great job. Yeah, of course. Um, just... Um, even if you can't be an officer, I think it's still um, really nice to like come into the events and see what's going on and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I think Natalie yeah. has a question. Natalie? Yeah, hello, hello. Um, thank you so much for hosting this event. I always learn a lot from every guest speaker event. So my question for the officer um, application is, so I saw that you guys will consider um, active member first, like as a priority, as a priority. But for me, I am like an active member for the whole academic year, but I am like almost active for each quarter. So does it consider as an active member or not? Uh, so you mean you've been to every meeting? No, no. Uh, so can you explain more about what you um, mean by that? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Um, like I just got two points for last quarter, I think, and then I got another two points for um four quarter. So, oh wait, let me, um, give me a second. I I'm gonna check my points. Because I saw that the spread on the spreadsheet, um, you guys have um the spreadsheet for each quarter, right? Yeah. And then for each quarter, I saw that my status is um almost active, but then I checked the spreadsheet for um the twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three academic year, and then I saw my status is active, so I don't know what my status my status is right now um so if you're uh, active status and you should still be active okay um wait a second okay so um for me um i have um a total of um six credits like six points right now but for my four term i have two points and then for my winter term I have um I have three points and then for this quarter 
I have two points. So does it consider an active member? Um, yes, I believe that you are considered an active member. Um, and the reason that we say that we um, prioritize active members is because um, those members are the ones that know most what goes on into the club and how we run things. So it's um, they have more of an idea of what it takes to be sort of an officer. Um, that's why we say that we prioritize active members is because they know um, how our events are run. They know um, how we, we usually do things and stuff like that. That's why. And how do you check your status as a member? So you can check your status. Um, on our spreadsheet. And Manny, if you can please paste that in the chat. We have a public spreadsheet, I believe, where we can, um, where you can check your status, but you can also um, ask us and we'll put, um, we can personally tell you what your status is. Do we have okay, any other- Okay, thank you so much. All right. Yeah, so um, you can still apply for our um, officer board, but um, regardless of what your status is, yeah. All right, guys, if you don't have any other questions or comments, you're all free to go. I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> that waffle, that was still there. <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself. I wanted to cry so much time. I have trauma now. I kept going up and down on the participants list to see who looked suspicious and I kicked them out. And I feel like I kicked out like legit members now. I yeah, feel I, like I think the first one, he was a normal one. Mm -hmm. The one with the webcam. Yeah, I'm like no, he was not normal. The Portuguese guy, he was I asked him if he was a troll, he responded to me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but then he, he ended, ended up trans... trolling us. He ended yeah. up well, I no, I could tell it. he was a troll too because like you could see his like camera, it was like static the whole time and it would like change. He was just staring, right? Okay. Well, that's, Neymar. Neymar. that's not him. But that's why that first guy was a troll because his name was literally Ernesto de la Cruz and that's from Coco. Oh, that's... <laughs> so why... Wait, so that's why did Coco? you go to shout out? Yeah, that's, that's the name of the villain in Coco. Oh, you know Golden Shower? We're not admitting him anymore. And then he tried to join again as Golden Shower. Oh, Golden Shower. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, why did he did out? join. He joined on the other guy's phone. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> That's his, it was his friend's phone. That was Golden Shadow speaking to us. Do you remember that? Oh, oh. was it? That's Yeah, I kicked it. I, yeah, I kicked out because I was like, I'm not having like... <laughs> what was he? Yeah. Wait, what did he try to say? I think, I, He's like, I think they're all friends. I think so. I'm not... Because say something one like, guy... Um, why are you kicked me out or something like that? Like he said hella fast and then he just like laughed. Yeah, and then one guy was like, oh, we're going to jump your friends or something. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? Really? I was like, we're just, we're just burned out some kids. What do you want from us? Next year? I don't know. Guys, is there? Yeah, no, I heard that too. I heard we're going to jump you or something. I was yeah. like, wait, yeah. are they talking to me? I was like, me? <laughs> Anyways. But um, next year, I think, I don't know if there's an option, but if there is, I want it to make it so the participants- Wait, hold on. let me submit my application. Yeah, I can't <laughs> unmute. Oh my God, Paul. I still haven't submitted mine. Uh, I'll submit I, mine. I think for next year, a recommendation is, oh, it's like, you know, oh, by the way, that's like, you forgot to make us all co-hosts. Yeah, because I couldn't kick anyone out. Dude, I, I was oh, so I, I got it DM'd you as well, because, like, you know, since we're also supposed to moderate, like, it's also, like, so you can have less stress. Dude, I was so stressed because those slides, oh, my God, I had so much typos on those slides, and I was stressed because She's I think it. next year, next year, I'm going to have my iPad as Zoom and then my computer 
as another one to share because I don't know why, but I can I cannot share. Like it just it's so annoying. Mm -hmm. But she was so cool. I think we reached um I think our participants was like good. It was almost like 20 people without the trolls. So um, wait, but it literally says like we reported like six people in my email. Yeah, because I had to report them. Because I had to <laughs> well, like I, six. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> I had to remove to to remove them. I had to report them. Yeah. Megan joined at some point, and I I I was like, girl, I'm about to cry right now. But Megan joined. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like for five minutes, I think. I yeah, sure um, I saw Megan's name. But over, I think besides that, it was um. I think it was it went well. We had like good interaction and we had a good guest speaker. I'm just happy that we don't have any more because I can't deal with trolls. Um, should we send out like an email to Golden Chow to let like to like um uh, give him a warning or something? Um, no, we're just gonna remove him. We're not gonna um we're not gonna admit him anymore. Okay. Just remove uh, him from is? the Oh, I was gonna say remove him from the mailing list, but he still can join the Zoom for our Instagram. Yeah, so I think we should send him like an email to let him know. Wait, like, you, you know, does like, he follow the Instagram? Uh -huh. Yeah, he follows. He follows on everything. He even followed Megan. Like he followed her on LinkedIn too. What? Yeah, he's like obsessed. This dude, gold, bro, Golden Shells, is like. But also in the chat like people were, like i saw weird messages but also was like is golden shell like dming people as well i, I think, think so is. i got a dm i didn't get a dm or at least i didn't but like you know it's like we also have to like you know kind of like talk about hey if we hear you're, you're dming people we we have to kick you out because that's not cool yeah, can someone send him an email? I don't want to deal with that guy. Dude, what if he shows up to the formal? What That's what I said in the I said that in the messages. <laughs> he shows up looking like a whole police officer. <laughs> <You're saying>. <laughs> <laughs> he confronts us at the <laughs> I think I need a uh oh my god, I think I need a new computer. Because this computer, I don't know what's happening with this computer. It like takes forever to load. Anyways, bye guys. Oh, already? Bye. We have a meeting tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Bye guys. See you guys. Bye.